Well, good morning, everyone, and happy Sabbath. Good to see everybody this morning. So last week, excuse me, last Sabbath, Jolene and I had the privilege of being at the Upper Columbia camp meeting, and it was a blessing to be there. We had hoped to stream the message here, but I understand that the technology just, just didn't behave, which is unfortunate because I think you guys would have been blessed. The speaker presented a very basic message about God's love. And sometimes it's okay to get back to the basics, right? As Seventh-day Adventists, oftentimes we like really diving deep into prophecy and the end times, and that's very appropriate because we are Seventh-day Adventists. Adventists meaning we look forward to the soon coming of our Lord Jesus. Amen? But whether we dive into prophecy or whether we look at the basic um, love, principles of God's love, our focus always needs to be who? Jesus Christ. Because it's only Jesus that can transform our lives, right? Who else can transform our lives? Buddha can't transform people's lives. Muhammad can't transform people's lives. Trump and Biden can't transform our lives. Well, they might affect our lives. Only Jesus Christ can transform our lives, amen? So and then, Jolene and I, on Sunday, we went to Missoula for Sunday and Monday, and we met up with two of my sisters and some of my cousins that we haven't seen in a long time. So that was a big blessing. So short two-day vacation, and it goes fast, doesn't it? So before we dive into the scriptures, um, I'm going to say a quick word of prayer. Kind Heavenly Father, I ask that your Holy Spirit be with us now this morning as we open your word. Lord, give us wisdom and understanding that we can see a picture of Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. So the Bible is a unique collection of stories, historical accounts, and life lessons. Or is it more? It's much more, isn't it? Do you have a favorite story in the Bible? I... I do. We probably all do, right? Um, I'm going to look at stories. I titled this message, Jesus in the Story. I was trying to figure out what I was going to call this because we're going to look primarily in the book of Genesis. Not right away, but I want to look in the scripture, in the Old Testament scriptures. I want to delve, dive, dive deep into it and see a picture of Jesus. One of my favorite stories, I have to admit, actually it's probably more of a time period than a particular story, is the judges and the kings. How many else li likes that part of the history? I think it's fascinating. Um, particularly the story of King David and his son Absalom and Joab and all the mighty men. And when we read the Bible, when we read the scriptures, we should see a picture of Jesus. And I think I said this before. When we open any part of the scriptures, we should be looking for a picture of Jesus the plan of salvation, or the great controversy, or maybe all of them, right? Because that's what we really want to unlock and take a look at. Um, for instance, the story of David and Absalom. Ellen White has this to say about Absalom. Absalom sedulously courted the popular favor. Now, that's a word that isn't used in the English language very often anymore. It means to be very deliberate and intending to court the popular favor, day by day, this man of noble mien might be seen at the gate of the city where a crowd of suppliants waited to present their wrongs for redress. Absalom mingled with them and listened to their grievances, expressing sympathy with their sufferings and regret at the inefficiency of the government. 1 Samuel 15, 6 has this to say, Absalom behaved in this way toward the Israelites who came to the king asking for justice. So he what? He stole the hearts of the people. Does this sound familiar? Does this sound like a parallel to something here? Compare this with what the great controversy says about Lucifer. I'm going to read this. I don't have it up on the screen, but I'm going to read it. Little by little, Lucifer came to indulge a desire for self-exaltation. Thou hast set thy heart as of the heart of God. Thou hast said, I will exalt my throne above the stars of, 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 of God. I will also sit upon the mount of the congregation. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. 
Instead of seeking to make God supreme in the, the affections and allegiance of his creatures, it was Lucifer's endeavor to win their service and homage to himself. And covering the honor, and coveting, excuse me, the honor which the infinite Father had bestowed upon his Son. This prince of angels, aspired, this what of angels? Prince of angels aspired to power which was the prerogative of Christ alone to wield. Isn't that the story of Absalom? The prince goes in there and he steals the heart of the people. If only you guys would be under my administration. Wouldn't things be so much better? And he won the hearts of, of the people, it says. Did Lucifer win the hearts of the unfallen angels in heaven? A third of them. This is a perfect parallel. Do you see the parallel here? I think, to me, it's amazing to see a picture of the great controversy happening in these stories. I shared this with the kids in Sabbath school today. I, I'm glad to see you kids there and paying attention because we're going to dive deeper into what we studied upstairs. And you guys, are, I think you're going to enjoy it. This is going to be a fun little study as we get into the book of Genesis. But a crucial principle about Bible study, and Clinton read this a little bit ago. It says, you, this is Jesus speaking, and he's speaking to the Pharisees at the time. And Jesus was persecuted, wasn't he? He was persecuted by a lot of people, but by none so much as the church leaders and the Pharisees. And he said to them, you search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and these are they which testify of me. What testifies of him? Well, the scriptures. Do we have eternal life through the scriptures, through the word of God, yes or no? Well, yeah, we do, but what is Jesus saying here? See, these people believed they had eternal life based on a raw knowledge of Scripture. These scholars were experts in the Scriptures, but when the culmination of their hopes of the Scripture came to them face to face, they rejected him and they wanted him to die. So their raw knowledge of the Scripture didn't do them a lot of good, did it? In fact, in verse 40, it says, Jesus says, but you are not willing to come to me that you may have life. Apparently, the scripture is not an end to itself, but a means to the end, which is who? Jesus Christ. So what I mean is that the purpose of the scripture is not just to be read and understood on its own, but to lead people into a deeper relationship with an understanding of Jesus Christ. It emphasizes that the scriptures are tools or a pathway to knowledge and experiencing Jesus. So when we read through Genesis, for example, we aren't just reading about creation, Adam and Eve, and the Garden of Eden, and all these things. We're studying and reading about the Creator. And I think this is important for us to understand. The Apostle Paul has this to say. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. Who's Paul talking about? He's talking about Jesus Christ. So the God who created the heaven and the earth is who? Who? Do you believe that? Absolutely. Amen. So the creation story, guys, is not just about creation. It's about our creator. Genesis 3, we get into that, and man falls. But right there in that account, we see the first messianic prophecy foretelling the coming of the Savior, Jesus Christ. Genesis 3.15 says, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy heel, and thou shalt bruise his heel. And so therefore, as soon as we see sin come into the world, we see what? A Savior, right? There's the prophecy right there. Later in the book of Genesis, we see Jesus in the story of Abraham, giving his prophecy about the future of Israel and the destruction of the wicked Sodom and Gomorrah, which, by the way, Sodom and Gomorrah prefigure the destruction of the wicked in the last days. So is the study of Abraham 
a study of, of end times? It is. Jude has this to say. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal life. Or, or, yeah, eternal life. Eternal fire, excuse me. Then we see a picture of Jesus in the story of Jacob. And I know we're fast-forwarding here really fast to the book of Genesis because when we get to Joseph, we're going to take it really slow because it, I think it's going to be really exciting for you guys to see this come alive. In the picture of, of Jacob, we see the ladder, which represents who? Okay, I need you to wake up. Who does it represent? <laughs> Jesus. And here's what Genesis records. And he lighted upon a certain place and tarried there all night because the sun was set. And he took the stones of that place and put them for his pillows and laid down in that place to sleep. And he dreamed. And behold, a ladder set up on the earth and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God ascended and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham thy father and the God of Isaac, the land whereon thou liest. To thee will I give it and to thy seed. So here Jesus in the book, in the New Testament now, he's speaking to Nathaniel here, right? And he tells Nathaniel that he, Jesus, is that ladder which Jacob saw. I love this. And Nathanael said unto him, or I, and, he, and Jesus said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Hereafter ye shall see heaven open, and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. You know, I want to take a moment to make this point. You know, there are some people who believe that we don't need the Old Testament Scriptures. We only need the New Testament Scriptures. Um, I would disagree. I would have to conclude that we can't truly understand what Jesus or the apostles are saying without at least a general understanding of the Old Testament scriptures. Um, the New Testament, after all, is written on the foundation of the Old Testament. It uses Old Testament imagery and language and parallels. And I love it how when it comes together, when you see these stories in Genesis or somewhere else, and Jesus kind of makes that clear, doesn't he? Now, I want to look at the parallel between Joseph and Jesus. By far the most clear, vivid picture of Jesus that we can see in the book of Genesis. In fact, it shows Jesus not only as our Redeemer, but our soon and coming King. Patriarchs and Prophets has this to say, The life of Joseph illustrates the life of Christ. Now, everything I'm about to share with you you can read Patriarchs and Prophets and you can see her account on it, a lot of it. And I think you're going to find this really interesting. So kids, pay attention now because this is going to get really cool. Joseph was the beloved son of his father. Now, we're not going to read all of the story, of course. I'm just going to assume we're all fairly familiar with the story of, of Joseph, right? So I'm just going to hit the points and I'm going to parallel that with Jesus. Joseph was the beloved son of his father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children. Jesus was the only begotten son of his father in heaven. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Joseph was sent by his father on a mission to find his wayward brothers. Interesting, yes? Jesus was sent by his father on a mission to seek and save his wayward people. And we're going to look at these step by step by step. And I'm really hoping this is going to open this up and you're going to see these parallels between this story and Jesus. Joseph was hated by his brothers because his life of faithfulness exposed their wickedness. So Joseph lived the right and his brothers lived the wrong, right? And when they were naughty, what would Joseph do? He would tell his father, wouldn't he? Um, when you're living in the wrong and somebody is living in the right, he irks you, right? That's just the way life is. That's just the way humanity is. It's not because 
he's offensive inherently, it's because when goodness comes into the room, it exposes your darkness or your, your wickedness. Um, it was the same with Jesus. He was hated by his own people because his holiness or life of faithfulness exposed their darkness. And this is the condemnation that life is coming to the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. It's not because they couldn't like Jesus. It was because they wouldn't. And the same was true with Joseph. As Joseph was on his way, instead of appreciating his arrival, his brothers plotted to what? Kill him. Hmm. Instead of appreciating his arrival, when Jesus came, his people plotted to kill him. He came to his own, and his own received him not. You know, this reminds me of a parallel. Um, it's a parable in, that Jesus spoke in Luke 20, 13 through 14, and it goes like this. Then said the Lord of the vineyard, What shall I do? I will send my beloved son. It may be that they will reverence him when they see him. But when the husbandmen saw him, they reasoned among themselves, saying, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, that the inheritance may be ours. You know, Joseph was chosen as the heir, right? I mean, you remember the coat of many colors. Why did his father give him this coat of many colors? It was to show that he was the next in line. He had the birthright. The, the lineage was going to be passed on to him. And his brothers hated him for that. And they wanted to kill him. Um, Jesus, of course, is the heir to the throne. And they hated him. So you see the parallel there? Isn't this interesting? Joseph was sold to his captors for 20 pieces of silver. Jesus was sold for 30 pieces of silver. In his Egyptian captivity, Joseph was severely tempted, yet he remained faithful and didn't sin against God. Remember Potiphar's wife? Um, he resisted and overcame. And was he rewarded for his faithfulness? Yes or no? No, he wasn't. Jesus, when he began his earthly ministry, he was baptized and then led into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And say, he saith unto him, all these things will I give to thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Wow. Mrs. White had this to say. Time and time again, Satan would come to him, cleverly and subtly tempting him. In fact, he offered the whole world to him. And guys, I think, by the way, Mrs. Potiphar came to Joseph with more than just herself as the temptation. I think she came to him and said, Joseph... I have the power to give you a, a higher standing. I can give you so much more if you'll just do this one thing. Just do this one thing. Joseph didn't sin when he was faced with that temptation. Praise the Lord. And neither did Jesus. And Hebrews 4.15 says of him, but was in all points tempted like we were yet without sin. So again, a perfect parallel between these, these two. When Joseph refused to sin against God, he was put into prison based on false accusations. Just like Joseph was falsely accused, did they falsely accuse Jesus? They even brought, they brought in false witnesses, right? They couldn't find anything against him, so they had to lie. So the parallel is perfect again. The very plan by which Joseph's enemies purposed to thwart the prophecies concerning him actually ended up fulfilling those prophecies. Did you get that? I'm going to read that one more time. The very plan by which Joseph's enemies purposed to thwart the prophecies concerning him actually ended up fulfilling those prophecies. You know, Joseph had dreams. Remember his dream with the sheaves? What happened? You remember? The brothers' sheaves all bowed down to his sheave. They didn't like that, did they? They didn't want that dream to come true. They wanted to destroy him so that dream wouldn't come true. Remember the story? Let's get rid of this guy right here, right now, today. That's what they said. Well, the same thing happened to Jesus. The cross was intended to thwart those very prophecies, but Christ's death on the cross actually ended up fulfilling those prophecies. 
This is interesting. Listen to this. The very act by which Joseph's brother sought to destroy him, namely selling him into slavery, became the very means that God used to save them from starvation and death. They thought to end Joseph, but the act ended up saving them. Isn't that interesting? And again, the very act by which Jesus' uh, people sought to destroy him, namely turning him over the cross to the Romans to be crucified, became the very means used by God to save them. And by the way, us too, if we choose to accept it. To be saved from sin and death, the consequence of sin. Don't, is this amazing? I mean, the parallels are just awesome to me. I hope you guys are enjoying this because I, when I read through these things, it's just amazing to me. When Joseph's brothers finally recognized him, they wanted the opportunity to see him face to face and repent and tell him they are sorry. They sought his forgiveness and he willingly forgave them. And sure enough, Joseph's brothers had that opportunity, right? Um, when they had genuine repentance, how did Joseph treat them? He forgave them, right? He didn't punish them. He did put them through a little bit of a trial so they would see their need for repentance and recognize in themselves a desire to repent. And friends, the same thing is true about Jesus Christ. He allows trials to bring us into the point where we desire to come to him with true, genuine repentance. And then he what? He freely forgives us. I love this verse. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's a promise. I love that promise, don't you? Amen. He not only forgives us, friends, but he can take away those ungodly desires. That's what it means, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Did you ever wonder what exactly does that mean? He can take away those sinful desires. When we have true repentance, that means we can be forgiven and we turn away from it. And he gives us the power to no longer want the uncleanness in us. You know, I talked about how only Jesus can transform lives. I've met hundreds of people, friends, that when they met Jesus, their lives are different. Hey, raise your hand if you know people like that. We all know people like that. I'm one of them. A lot of you are nodding your heads. I'm one of them. The things that I loved when I was a kid, I hate now. And the things that weren't important to me, I cherish today. And that's the power of the transformation of Jesus Christ. And that's what we need to strive for, right? After he forgave his brothers, do you recall what he had them do? This is really interesting. He told them to go home and not only proclaim that he was alive, but that he was seated on the throne next to the king. Do I hear an amen? amen. Have them come to me. Go home and tell your families and have them come to me. Now, if they simply went home and told Jacob that he was alive, would that have been true? Yes, but it wouldn't have been the whole truth. Jacob, Joseph is not only alive, but he's the ruler of all of Egypt. The Bible tells us that when Jacob heard these things, his heart stopped. He was almost more than he could bear. He didn't believe them, but when he saw evidence, he revived. Who being the brightness of the glory and the express image of, the, of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when we had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. There Hebrews is telling us that he's sitting right next to the king, just like Joseph, right? In fact, he is the king. He's the king of kings and lord of lords, amen? What a perfect parallel. And now Jesus tells us, just like Joseph said, go into all the world and tell others of me. When Joseph sent for them to him, he brought them evidence of his power and authority. Genesis 45, 25 records this. And they went up out of Egypt and came into the land of Canaan unto Jacob their father, and told him, saying, Joseph is yet alive, and he is the governor 
over all the land of Egypt. And Jacob's heart fainted, for he believed them not. And they told him all the words of Joseph, which he had said unto them. And when he saw the wagons which Joseph had sent to carry him, the spirit of Jacob, their father, revived. So what, did, what made him revive? It was the evidence that not only was he alive, but he's calling them on, unto him. When Jesus uh, went to his father, he brought evidence with him, resurrected saints as tokens of the great harvest to come. This showed that his mission was not only a success, but the plans for the future could go forward. So again, a perfect parallel. And as they are coming, Joseph comes out to see his father. And Joseph made ready his chariot and went up to meet Israel, his father, to Goshen and presented himself unto him. And he fell on his neck and wept on his neck a good while. Wow. What a happy reunion that would have been, right? If you haven't already done so, I would highly recommend that you read the last chapter of The Desire of Ages. What a beautiful account of Jesus reuniting with his father. This is just a small little passage. The father's arms encircle his son, and the word is given, let all angels of God worship him. Isn't that beautiful, guys? A perfect parallel of Jacob and Joseph meeting again. His son, who was thought to be dead, was now alive again. Jesus was dead. He died for our transgressions, now is alive again. Amen? And he's reunited with the Father. When Joseph brought his brothers and all they brought with them, they were not treated like slaves, but were given the best of the land. And Joseph placed his father and his brethren and gave them a possession in the land of Egypt. In the best of the land. In the what of the land? In the best of the land. The land of Ramesses and Pharaoh, as Pharaoh had commanded. Genesis 47, 11. And when we bring others to Jesus, we and they will be given the best of the best. Matthew 25, 23 says, His Lord said unto him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of the Lord. And this verse is really awesome. But as it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God prepared for them that love him. You know, I don't have really a very good imagination. But sometimes... I sit down or I'm laying in bed and I think about heaven. You ever do that? You ever think about streets of gold? You think about the beauty of the place, the tree of life by the river. You think about no sickness, no pain, nobody who hates you and you don't hate anybody and we shouldn't be hating anybody anyway. But just a place of love and peace. That's where my imagination goes. I'm thinking, Lord, I want to be worthy to be there. But am I worthy to be there? I am because Jesus Christ paid the price. Amen? And you're all worthy to be there. But my imagination is nothing. It says, it has never entered into the heart of man the thing which God has. So all of our imagination isn't even close to what God has in store for us, right? So keep looking to the prize. Keep looking to Jesus. But wait, there's more. Joseph told them, I am your brother. And Joseph said unto his brethren, Come near to me, I pray you. And they came near, and he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. Now, isn't that beautiful? For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brothers. He calls us brothers and sisters, right? Jesus is our brother. We're, we're, our sins are responsible for his death. We're as guilty as Joseph's brothers. Right? And just like Joseph, when they came to him with genuine repentance, he, he holds out his arms for them. Says, I'm your brother. I'm not going to hurt you. I'm going to take care of you. Jesus does the same for us. 
Joseph's dying request was not to leave his bones stay in Egypt. This is, this is really touching. This is amazing. Even though he was dead, he wanted his final resting place to be where his people are. He wanted to be, even his bones wanted to be where, where his people are. Similarly, though returning to his father, Jesus isn't going to have heaven be our or his home forever, right? He's going to move his kingdom to earth to be with us, his people. That is so awesome. Guys, you know, if we went past, I'm going to read this verse first. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, come down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. Forever we will be with Jesus. Amen? Amen. So if we went past Genesis, and this is where Genesis closes, if we kept going, guys, we would see the same thing in Exodus and all the other books of the Bible. I shared some of it with you out of the book of Samuel. We need to look for Jesus every time we open this book, don't we? Because Jesus needs to be the, our focus in whatever we're studying. Pick random, pick a study, and we should find Jesus. We should not only find Jesus, but I like what one of my students upstairs said. She said, it's not only just finding Jesus, but it's seeing his love. That's pretty good for a 10-year-old, 11-year-old. Sorry, I can't remember your age, Lisa. <laughs> 11, I think. We need to see Jesus and get to know him before he comes. Because he's coming back soon, amen? But I want you to think about this before we close. Friends, when others see your story, do they see Jesus? Is there some kind of reflection in your story? You don't have to answer that, but I just want you to think about it. As Christians, we need to strive That's our desire, right? To reflect the character of Jesus in our lives, in our words, in our actions, in our own story. Jesus is found everywhere in this book. I want people to think, wow, when I visit Edgemere, I see a little glimpse of Jesus. When I go to so-and-so's house, wow, I wonder if Jesus treated people like that. Amen? This should be our goal. That's what I want to leave you with. So at this time, let's have our our closing song. I'll invite the choristers up at this time.